Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are now on site in Manhattan, in New York City, New York. We are at the New York Presbyterian Hospital slash Weill Cornell Medicine. We are gonna be talking about all things neuroscience, all things consciousness, all things mental health and well-being, all things future. I'm super excited to be talking to Dr. Heather Berlin. Hello. Hello. Thank you for joining us on I'm the show. So glad you're here. Greatly appreciate it. <laughs> and I'm really excited because Heather is super prominent in the neuroscience field, very world renowned, and her background is super long. So I have a Cliff Notes version of her background. She's a multi-award winning neuroscientist and science communicator, assistant professor of psychiatry at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, practices clinical neuropsychology at New York Presbyterian Hospital slash Wild Cornell Medicine. And she's a host of PBS's Science Goes to the Movies, Discovery Channel, Superhuman Showdown, Star Talk All Stars, and a big promoter of women in STEAM. This is really exciting. You have such a cool background. You're a huge role model to me and so many others in the field of neuroscience. And let's do this. Let's have a good let's have a good chat. So yeah. um, Heather, this is I always like to take a big history perspective on things to start. And I like the word that you used, you used the word sculpting. I mm -hmm. like that word, with the mind. Mm -hmm. So we've now, we now find ourselves as stewards of Earth after so many billions of years of evolution on Earth. And, and now our mind has evolved a lot over the last six million years to become what it has. The nervous system has evolved much longer than that. But okay, so now we're here, we're absorbing much different stimuli than we were even a thousand or a hundred thousand years ago. So tell us about the sort of big history take on the evolution of the mind and now we sculpt forever and we sculpt until we die. So we have to be constant learning. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a number, well, you brought up a number of issues, but one thing that kind of is particularly interesting, I think, you know, so we've evolved these brains in basically over thousands of years, but really to adapt to this sort of caveman environment. And the rate of growth of technology is way quicker than our biological evolution. So we have something actually in the mental health field uh, called the mismatch um, theory or hypothesis of, about psychiatric illness. And basically it's that you can explain almost every psychiatric illness um, by basically a mismatch of the modern environment with a caveman brain, like what we've evolved to adapt and respond to. And so, you know, if you even, anything right now, what we're on this 22nd floor, right? Well, you know, we've evolved to have a fear of heights because that's adaptive. You don't want to fall off the cliff or whatever. But now you have some people who are standing on the 22nd floor and looking out, it's totally safe. We know that, but these mechanisms are still going on. And so now that we have this extreme, horrible anxiety and fear of heights, even though it seems irrational, it actually would be rational if they were in an environment that our brains evolved to be in. So we're, we're slow in terms of biology of catching up to where technology is. And we are kind of like these cavemen brains in you know modern societies, and there's gonna be some mismatches. Um, so you know that being said, that's like sort of the overview picture, but then of course each individual within our own individual lifespan is evolving over time in our own way to the environment. But you still have these programs that are running that are you know, evolutionarily older as well, that are driving us and motivating us. So we're kind of like, it's always like there's, there's a bit of a, we have this prefrontal cortex that's sort of telling us to do these rational things in this world that we find ourselves in, but we have these basic basal drives that are like evolutionarily older. Yeah. I like how you uh, make this really interesting way of, of, of understanding how our, the, the biological circuitry and systems within ourselves has evolved at a biological pace, but technology is exponential and the stimuli now are so, we find ourselves on the 22nd floor, we find ourselves getting the ding, 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 like information foraging all the time. Mm -hmm. So there's all these different, we're eating such processed crazy food in such abundance that's another thing i mean that's why obesity is such a problem because like we've evolved to like store fat and things because we don't know the next time we're going to get a meal right if you're hunting and 
you know, but now just everything is readily available. So these mechanisms that make us crave like fats, high fat foods, and because that was evolutionary adaptive or sugars, it's no longer really adaptive when everything is available in front of you. And then you start getting these problems like obesity and other diseases that are related to diabetes. Yeah. And then you also have this real, I want to, we'll, we'll move into, um, you, you have a really good way of explaining this too. There's this sort of, um, there's processing that occurs in our minds and the processing can be you know we we normally think as oh i i see things or i touch things or i taste things and it registers in my mind and it evokes some sort of a memory that i've uh, associated with that item and that collective we we've learned that this is red and that your glasses are red and that this food is this taste and then there's this unconscious sort of mind that does our blinking and our breathing, the autonomic nervous system. So yeah, tell us a bit about, because sometimes it doesn't even feel like there is free will. <laughs> so tell us a there's bit. There's not, it's just an illusion. Uh, <laughs> wait, what was the question? What do you want to tell you about the let's go. Let's go into unconscious and conscious processing. Um, so I mean with, so, so basically we, we, we put so much value into consciousness because that's how we sort of e experience the world. But really much of what's happening in the brain is happening unconsciously outside of awareness and not just things like controlling your you know, automatic nervous system, uh, autonomic ner nervous system, your heart rate and your gut and metabolism and all the rest. But um, really these decisions that we make, our behaviors, much of it is being decided by processes that are occurring in the brain outside of awareness. And then we're sort of, consciousness is like the last to find out about it. And then we have this feeling like, oh, I made that decision or I had that intention. But when we look at a whole slew of neuroscientific studies, you can see that we can measure your brain activation and see it like, moving, let's say, if you're gonna go to the left or the right, a number, even seconds before you're consciously aware of your intention to go left or right, let's say. So, you know, in a sense, you know, free will is an illusion. It's sort of happening after the fact. You feel like, oh, I have the intention to do this, but your brain has already decided. So I sometimes say, like, we might have, our unconscious brain has free will. We're just, like, the last to know about it or something, you know, because it, the brain is doing the deciding, and you're, sometimes you're conscious of it, sometimes mm -hmm. you're not. You know, sometimes you get conscious access to what your brain already decided, and sometimes your brain just decides outside of awareness and it never comes to consciousness. But either way, the brain is doing the deciding. And, you know, consciousness is a side sort of aspect to that, yeah. So we're, th there's, what, there's so much uh, additional uh, aspects to, uh, over time that we've evolved with this, we have this gut, that make that, we, that, we, that somehow we work with this massive gut bacteria and tons of uh, neurons as well in there. Um, we have uh, an environment that is that we think, like you said, that we get to move ourselves around in. But these decisions we are have we're mapping that these decisions we become aware of only seconds after. The yeah. unconscious makes up at the mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the gut is another great example. I mean, there's a n more neurons, and serotonin neurons in your gut than parts of your brain, and it's like, well, why isn't that conscious? But it is giving information. There's, a, you know, a lot of psychiatry is looking at the relationship between the gut and the brain and how that relates to psychiatric illness, and even some experimental research in for treating obsessive compulsive disorder is looking at fecal matter, um, you know, implants as yeah. a treatment to like repopulate this microbiome because it's actually affecting brain function. Um, so there's just a lot going on. At, or even other things like outside of the disease realm, but like who you choose to be your mate or who you're attracted to. There's all these unconscious things that are at play that are attracting you from you know smells and the, uh, the behavioral signals that we're not even consciously aware of. And uh, you know, there are women who, you know, when you're in certain parts of your cycle, that you're going to be more attracted to certain people than another than others, which is interesting. Uh, so there's just a lot going on, and we think we're so much in control, and we're really it's our biology, our underlying biology that's motivating a lot of it. What we do. Yeah. 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 And then there's this very strange uh, way that we this, these are called uh, the, these these this qualia, this subjective experience of, of, of living and even that 
feels once you have once you have a meta perspective on it, it feels weird to feel living. Yeah. Well, just to have subjective states. I mean, that that's the thing, really. Like when we're talking about consciousness, you don't need language. You don't need self awareness uh, to have conscious. We're talking about basic sensory sensation experience. So first person subjective experience, just simply feeling pain. Not like, oh, it's me who's feeling the pain or that feels like this or that. It's just the feeling of pain or seeing the color red. And with AI systems, for example, like they might be able to do very intelligent things like lots of complex processing of like, you know, they can do mathematical equations and things much quicker or better than we can. But the simplest thing of just having a feeling or a sensation, they might not never ever do. We don't know. I mean, this might be a distinctly biological trait. I mean, there's there's arguments on both sides, but you know, and humans aren't the only ones. Other animals, other species have this have subjective states as far as we can tell. Yeah. Again, it's always subjective. Yeah. It's always first person. Like I don't know your conscious. I assume you are, but yeah. I only know I am, but I assume other beings are. And that may also be a sort of this 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 complex uh, biological processing that's going on at the level of hundreds of billions of neurons and glial cells versus maybe like dozens in a fly. Right. And so is that a level of consciousness that's just much, much less than ours is? So there's different arguments there. It might just be a different type of consciousness. It depends on the theory of consciousness that you sort of adhere to. Um, so if you look at the integrated information theory of consciousness, that basically says that consciousness is a property of the universe like gravity is. And so anytime there is any kind of a system that has a high degree of integrated, differentiated information, it's basically about information processing. Mm -hmm. And you can calculate that. You'll get a number of five, it's called. And basically that number corresponds to the amount of consciousness in that system. So you could say a fly has a lower phi, a less amount of integrated, differentiated information than our brains do. So they have some sort of consciousness, but it's different than ours. I, I mean, I like to say it's like either you have sensation or you don't. It's kind of like an all or none. And then there's different aspects to that sensation. Maybe they're enhanced the more you have. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Julia Tononi, who came up with this theory of, of the integrated information theory, talks about that a bit in that that's somewhat panpsychist right it's a yeah it is it is somewhat pan it is panpsychist it means that like which basically is saying that any system doesn't have to be a biological system or anything that has some degree of inf integrated information can have it mm -hmm. a light switch has a bit of information that's on or off mm -hmm. so it might have some degree of phi mm -hmm. consciousness but that's sort of meaningless to me because it's not the kind of consciousness that we're really Mm -hmm. talking about when we're trying to understand consciousness. Light switches aren't building 22 floor buildings and airplanes and right. AI. Yeah. Right. But, you know, other animals like dolphins, we know are pretty aware yeah. and intelligent. We know they have self-awareness. They can pass this mirror recognition test, like basically recognize themselves in a mirror. Yep, yep. And, um, you know, but they don't have the appendages that we have. Like the development of our thumbs was a really important yeah. thing that we can grasp things and hold tools and yeah. that led to a lot of other things. Dolphins maybe could have done the things that we do, but they're limited by their, you know, appendages basically. And yeah. Yeah. they do have language, it appears they speak to each other. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't think it's distinctly human, but panpsychic can be anything can have it to some, some degree. But basically this, this theory, the more um, you have in your kind of repertoire, the more like that conscious experience is. So like basically, let's say your experience of red. If the only colors you knew, knew of, let's say you had some sort of form of color blindness, and the only colors you were capable of seeing, let's say is red, blue, and green. And according to this theory and the way the calculations are done, your experience of red would be very different because you're experiencing, you're experiencing red in terms of what it's not. And if your repertoire of what it's not is only two other things, red is going to have a diff different feeling, different quality to it than if you had a million colors in your, in your you know, wheelhouse. 
Yeah, like the word love in the United States versus in English versus the word love in Hindi, where there's so many different ways to to say that or to talk about what that feels like across, similar to you you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, wherever the nervous system sort of finds itself evolving is where those different stimuli build up, such as a dolphin in the oceans will have a nervous system that builds up certain talents in the, in an ocean setting. Mm -hmm. um, a plant, another decent example is just the, it was very interesting seeing a plant communicate to other parts of the plant when an insect bit it mm -hmm. and then there was a communication of hey like well, this is a stress hormone we got stress happening right now we just got bit right so that's kind of like consciousness and that's oh, some yeah. form of you know yep. some form of it we information might say processing. information yeah. information processing yeah so heather does a lot of brain behavior relationships um specifically the prevention and treatment of impulsive and compulsive psychiatric disorders um so this is this is really crazy because this is like seeing this is a lot seeing patients uh dealing with different ailments mm -hmm. providing solutions to those ailments you even have to go to court sometimes to say that yeah i was in court yesterday i know <laughs> yeah. yeah how many yeah. patients do you think you've seen through your career oh my god uh i mean there's on the order of Thousands, I don't thousands, know, maybe, yeah. probably, yeah. I thousands, mean, yeah. I've been doing clinical, you know, I've been working with patient populations since, uh, that's gonna make me feel really old right now, but. 2000? <laughs> probably 2000, maybe, maybe like actually starting in like 1999, I would say. So where it's like 20 years, two decades. I feel old now, see, I knew that would make me feel, but whatever, yeah, so two decades of. It's a lot of people seeing a lot of people. I can imagine, I don't know, like, I'm not really good at estimating, but I imagine yeah. it's a lot of yeah. patients, and um, and plus I've worked in, you know, in hospital wards where you get large groups of patients here, but, but, but mostly the, the patient populations that I've um, worked with or done research on um, are either people who have some sort of either traumatic brain injury um, in terms of the neurological patients um, or like some sort of lesion because they had a tumor removed or um, uh, a stroke. Um, so neurological lesion patients and traumatic brain injury patients and, um, and also patients with movement disorders more recently who need, who we do deep, deep brain stimulation to treat like Parkinson's and those kinds of things and neuropsych testing of all these patients, these neurological patients, and then also psychiatric patients. Um, and those have mostly been people with um, anxiety disorders, impulse control. Yeah. So anxiety disorders, mostly like obsessive compulsive disorder, um, impulse control disorders, things like pathological gambling, um, and uh, mostly like people in the impulsive compulsive spectrum and also some and personality disorders. So I did a lot of work with people with borderline personality disorder. And, and then what I did, which was sort of novel when I was first doing, this was my PhD work, was comparing people who have sp specific brain lesions where we know kind of like where the hole in the head is to psychiatric patients on neurocognitive measures to see where they were similar and where they're different. Because a psychiatric patient, there's no one place in the head you can point to. But if we see overlapping symptomology, we can know that that part of the brain is involved. And I've done a lot of neuroimaging mm -hmm. and psychopharmological studies. So the, the techniques I use is mostly neuropsych testing, functional magnetic resonance imaging, mm -hmm. um, and psychopharmological studies. That's the yeah. clinical stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is a big deal because there is, I think it's um, on the order of uh, 10 million people in the United States have PTSD. And there's just a lot of depression, OCD, anxiety going on around the world. There's a lot of in transgenerational global trauma that has built up over time. Yeah. And, and we have now the tools with deep brain stimulation, all these interesting uh, tools are evolving um, and we can potentially uh, manipulate the emotions in a beneficial way. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I think I read a study once where they said the thing that causes the most human suffering 
um, is actually um, anxiety and mood disorders and things like depression and anxiety because some, and you would think that sounds a little strange, but other things, I don't know, maybe you're talking about like terminal cancer or whatever, but then people end up dying or whatever, but when you're looking at the living and suffering, psychiatric illness causes the most suffering over a lifetime yeah. than any other kinds of you know diseases that so so the fact if we can actually and also the other caveat is psychiatry hasn't really in the last 50 years there haven't been really huge major breakthroughs in terms of um, psychopharmacology you know we do a little tweaking of, okay, well, maybe this SSRI or serotonin reuptake inhibitor, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor is going to, you know, affect this serotonin receptor. And we'll do a little tweak and it's going to do this serotonin receptor or that. But we haven't really cured the diseases. But with more, more recently, things like deep brain stimulation um, is very promising. It's been used for many years with, uh, with movement disorders. Um, and a lot of work being done here at Cornell is deep brain stimulation for like Parkinson's and other kinds of movement disorders. And now we're moving into the realm of psychiatric illness where we can go in and stimulate parts of like certain sort of circuits in the brain to help with depression and OCD. There's also, as alternative treatments, um, things like uh, ketamine has become yep. really a big thing right now with treating people, especially for treating suicidality yep. and, um, and depression, major depression and other things like psychedelics in the use as like with a therapist. Yeah, psychedelic psychotherapy. We just had yeah. Rick Doblin on the show again. We love MAPS. Yeah. We're huge fans. MAPS is yeah. cool. MAPS is cool. Yeah. So there's all of that, you know, and MDMA for PTSD and yes. uh, psilocybin for, uh, you know, anxiety. Addictions. So it's, yeah, yeah, addiction. Yeah. 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 So I think, you know, we are moving towards helping these people, but it's still, we're, it's a path. It's a long path. Yeah. And you're showing very promising results um, with helping with um, OCD and with depression. You're over 50% on, on, um, on helping re remove people from having those sort of tendencies, significant growth away from those tendencies. It's, you mean with the DBS or with? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah with, well, yeah, basically, yeah. yeah, these are like um, treatment refractory patients. So basically, they're refractory patients I and mean, they're treatment resistant. So yeah, yeah. these are patients who are very severe and they had to have tried a number of different drug trials and um, other like things like ECT, electric shock therapy, and really nothing has worked. And then what they used to do is go in and lesion parts of the brain for these, pa and, and sometimes it would work, but so if it didn't, you have a lesion in your brain. So that's not great, but you know, when you're desperate, that was the alternative, and now, with these deep brain stim with the stimulation, it's adjustable, it's reversible. Uh, you can control it remotely, you can turn it up, turn it down. If it doesn't work, you haven't really lesioned your brain. Um, but yeah, we're seeing pretty nice results. I mean, it's not everybody who gets it, but you know, if you can get even 50% improvement in, yeah, yeah. in maybe 70% of patients, that's like a big deal, yeah. And then there's, this is also important to say, and correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but there can be these, um, people whose behavior can be changed by by tumor growing in their prefrontal cortex or pressing on their amygdala and these are the times when they can potentially turn from a great citizen to someone that becomes a, a pedophile or someone that um, kills their family and this is a then, then, then you see the in the neuroimaging. Then you see, have to go and testify and say that mm -hmm. this, this is what happened. You can also go and remove the tumor, and then they come back to normal, to their normal self. Yeah, it's like these these where we're going from correlation to causation. So basically, you know, you are your brain. So when things happen, if you have a tumor, if you get a brain lesion, if you have a stroke, it depending on where it is, it can affect your personality you know what makes you you it's really just a construct of your brain and if your brain changes it can change fundamentally in many ways who you are your personality and those are classic cases especially with the prefrontal cortex uh, lesions that you see with like the case of Phineas Gage back in the 1800s and this big metal tamping iron went through his prefrontal cortex completely changed his personality um, and then there's more modern day cases like this person who developed pedophilia in his 40s and was going to be imprisoned and then they decided a huge tumor in his prefrontal cortex. You take out the tumor, symptoms go away. A year later, the symptoms come back and the tumor had grown back. And so 
it really starts to, to get question about, well, how much control do we really have? And, you know, everybody has subtle differences in their brain, but does that, is that an excuse for bad behavior? Um, but I, I liken it to, I think in the legal system, it's, does the person have the capacity to have self-control? And if they do, we hold them responsible for their actions. So, but if they have a huge tumor or if they have underactivation of certain parts of the brain, we say they don't have the capacity to be responsible. And, you know, then we have different, like, consequences for them. Yeah. And yeah. You've, you've been a big proponent of have, have creating a greater sense of compassion and uh, empathy towards other people's uh, ways that they've, their minds have been sculpted in, through their environments. And that sort of, uh, of, of, of essence and camaraderie across the planet can, can really be those that, that, that crucial next step for us to, to really find that sense of unity amongst each other is to, is to care more about how we got, how did you get to that point where right. you feel that way now? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, because I look at, I mean, I, everybody, I look at people as people, but also you have to remember, you can't get angry at someone if you're like, okay, that person is whatever, you take your bit, like, they're so annoying, they're so neurotic, or they always get really upset at the littlest thing or whatever. You know, that might just be their genetic underpinning. That's the way their brain developed. That's who they are. You can't, uh, you know, you can't get mad at someone for their predilections. You can ask them to understand what their predilections are and to try to, you know, modulate them. But people are wired in different ways and they have different, you know, different size amygdalas and different connections and you can't expect everyone to behave the way you want them to behave you have to take into consideration and even people at extreme ends who are pathological you know i mean you can a very good example is with the president of the united states right now i mean he does things that people really are just you know like how can somebody do that or 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 you know people who are so so sociopaths and have no empathy um i i feel bad for them because they have sort of that's abnormal. They have a disorder. It's a brain disorder, and you have to kind of have empathy for them and say, I, I understand that, that that's what that person is. They can't help it. Um, so if we could have more compassion for other people and not expect them that they should behave in this way or that way, but just understand that they're um, it's their biology. Yes, we can have some control over it. We're not all running around, you know, doing whatever we want, and but to the extent that they have the capacity to have control over those things, you know, and some people just don't. And we, we, we that also that compassion um, and empathy can drive us to a more nuanced discourse amongst each other on how to best move forward. Uh, because there's a lot, and this is a good segue, there's a mm -hmm. lot to, to deal with as we move into the world of neuroprosthetics, as we move into the world of these augmentations. There's a, there's a lot um, that, that we have now the power to manipulate emotion, um, to increase intelligence, to augment metabolism. There's a lot of things that we're gonna be playing around with genetic engineering with this also neuroprosthetic additions. Now, what do you, what, what, what are you, what, I guess, there's just, there's so much, there's so much to do here. The conversation around the ethics and the geopolitics of things, the conversation across the wealth and quality of things, you know, where, yeah. how do you, what are your, what's your synthesis on this? So I think that the, the technology is going to continue to develop because, let's say things like neural implants, because um, it's helping treat disorders, right? Everybody wants that, like, you see these Parkinson's patients and you know they're they're able to function or psychiatric disorders um, and that those are the neural uh, deep brain stimulation but there's also brain computer interfaces where you implant these microelectrodes and basically you can use your thoughts to control a prosthetic limb and now more recent studies are showing that like at Caltech you can get sensory information back to the brain and stimulate it so these prosthetic limbs not only can you control them with your thoughts, but they will send, that you can feel them. And so they really are becoming like your real limb, um, where people who are in, uh, who are completely paralyzed, who can now communicate using these uh, brain computer interfaces. Oh. So these are great things and they will continue to develop, but what will happen is inevitably that people will start using them in a healthy brain to enhance it and yeah. sort of for cognitive enhancement. And then, then you get into these ethical questions of like, who can afford the implants? Is it, I mean, because obviously if somebody has one, they're gonna have a huge advantage. Let's say if you can increase your memory capacity, 
over the people who don't. So maybe nobody's allowed to have them. Or and the same thing with um, genetic modification. I mean, right now it's not legal. We can't. We. I mean, technically we 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 could make designer babies, but legally we're not allowed to because. Or <laughs> we're not even allowed to sort of experiment in that in that way. But we should of all because the, ethical the single concerns. point mutations that are causing severe diseases; those are ones that should be eradicated. Right, but so it's it's this it's a really hard because there's positives and there's and there's negatives. And what do you do? And so I mean, we thought the same thing with stem cell research, and then it mm. was allowed. And you know, it was at the time a very big deal. Of I remember. George Bush like wasn't yeah. going to allow stem cell research, and then now we're finding could do all these amazing things to help cure disease. So the thing with the genetic mutation is that you might change something for one thing, but then you don't know what the consequences are going to be for other things. You know, it's not <coughs> excuse me, it's not as straightforward as in in some case, some cases it is. You can just it's a single point, you know, mutation. You take that out, but. For other things, it's more like we find the genetic relationship between autism and whatever, but then you might take something out that could have coded for some other thing we don't know about. That's right, yeah. yeah. So that's very complicated and that's harder. But if you're just talking about brain-computer interfaces, it's inevitable that someone is going to pay for their implant to help them do something, you know, to become superhuman. And then what do we what do we do then? So. These are academic debates we're having now, but they, in our lifetime, there will be real questions that we have to answer in real time. Yeah. Yep. There, there's a lot of potential with with malevolence, and it's and we gotta we gotta work ourselves through. We gotta we have to work ourselves through transcending malevolence and transcending ego and finding the unity and love between each other before. It seems that at times we're rushing to the transhumanist era, and that's and that rush is, is can be harmful because we don't we don't have the capacity for oops moments anymore. The yeah. you know the seatbelt and the airbag killed tens of thousands, maybe hundred thousand people, but existential risks are not okay for the civilization. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, we'll probably kill ourselves with climate change or something before then. Who knows? You're I mean, so optimistic. I know, I'm so optimistic. <laughs> I, I'm from the East Coast, so we are a You're little bit more. Yeah. yeah, we're a little bit more like. <laughs> no, but I like that. I like the. I could. I could switch into an optimistic worldview. Um, let's say if I was to do that, <laughs> what would that look like? <laughs> yeah, it's jaded East Coast New Yorkers. Um, no, but I mean. I, I think that it's, I, I'm sorry, I have to be pessimistic again. I think that I could, it's a last, it lasted for like a second. <laughs> it lasted a second, yeah. A thought. Well, it's just that, I guess I'm a realist. Maybe that's yeah, it. Yeah. I'm more like I a realist. I feel that way too, yeah. And I think that, you know, humans are not that evolved. We like to think that's we're right. so evolved. That's okay? right. Okay, but we're really not that evolved. And some humans are more evolved than others. That's right. But us as species, if you take the average, and I can tell you this, and this is gonna sound terrible, but like, you know, even if you're talking about like intelligence or whatever, you know, which is, is not everything. I mean, there's yeah. so many other things. But if you do, I do a lot of like intelligence testing for various reasons, and the average is 100. Yeah, on, on IQ. On IQ. Yeah. And if you see what 100 looks like, yeah. You know, totally. I mean, we're not that evil. You know, we're just trying to get by most people. Or trying to get by, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. this idea of, like, we're going to transcend everything and be above it all, I'm not that optimistic. But also, it's not just because of that, but I just think that we, we are still, like, animalistic. We have these basic drives. We have, you know, Freud talked about a lot of that as well. Yeah. You know, we have a kind of sort of death impulse as well as a kind of like life impulse in a way or that kind of um what do you call it like cathexis or whatever he had like you know but the positive kind of what is this it was li your libido mm -hmm. you have like a kind of positive energy but then there's a negative mm -hmm. and when it comes down to it like you can really test how far humans evolved when there's scarcity yeah yeah, that's right. Because then we're fighting right away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like if you take the most evolved people and then put them in like a, the Titanic and see who's going to go. That's right. You're going to get, now within the population, that's you're going right. to get a couple who are really noble and like, you know what, I'm going to die for whatever and women and children first. First, yeah. And you'll get some of those people, yeah. in the, but that's not going to be the majority. 
you know, yeah, and then you're going right. to have a lot of people who are just looking to themselves and survive. Right. So I just, I don't know how, I guess that's why I'm saying I'm not that optimistic that we are going to like evolve past all these kind of basal basic drives. Um, but there are, there are good people. There are good people. Everybody has good and bad. Okay. Everybody. But there are people who are more selfless, who are more yeah. giving. Yeah. And maybe they'll, over time, if those people have more children, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's there'll be more people like true, that. Yeah. You know, I mean, one of um, my husband's shows about evolution, he, he said the key to everything is just don't, to, to, it's women have control of who we choose to mate with. Yeah, that, yeah. And his whole thing was just don't sleep with mean people. So we, if women <laughs> mm. just only choose altruistic or, or oh, yeah. good people to, procreate with yeah. over time that's how we can change the course of human evolution in our in our species yeah um who, who do the mean guys procreate with them there's a lot of questions that that arise you actually had this good um you had a bell curve up for a moment with uh at the center of the distribution being a hundred on the on iq and then um, half of people being below that half of people being above that towards like 140 and towards 60 mm -hmm. and those are the types of moments where I do f have a deeper sense of realism that if that is in IQ is just, of course, like we said, there's one way. But at, at the same time, if you take a potential like a hierarchy and you um, and instead of sorting the hierarchy based on um, socioeconomic status, based on wealth, maybe you sort it based on altruism and uh, and uh, ones that have transcended their ego, maybe the ones that are furthest along in their um, spiritual journeys on Earth. Because if that right. was the case, then if we put more of them into positions of deciding on some of the resource flows and the frameworks for increasing the baselines across the world, we just move so fast. We're not slowing down and thinking. We're living in this, the basal limbic mm -hmm. um, uh, systems of thinking and not the slow down prefrontal executive functions, plan things, um, help uh, have the empathy and that altruism. But it's so hard when you have to run around and and, and just to feed yourself and pay your rent and stuff. So we you know, we have a, it's a really, it's a slow down and think and it's a and it's a stop fighting against each other. There's so much yeah. other. But I, but I agree, I mean, just with the thing, like IQ is not the thing, but like, you know, cause you could have an average low IQ that's, and be a, a hugely like evolved spiritual, however you want to say it, um, person. And I think that like you were saying, one of the keys is the people who are in power, unfortunately, aren't those types of people who seek out these power positions, right? Because yeah. they're not about ego. That's right. And so, That's right. you know, we'd have to rearrange society in such a way that we at least have someone like that on teams of where people are making decisions. Um, because that's the only way, like, things are going to change on a more global scale. Like, yeah. you need the decision makers to have either themselves have some empathy or compassion or have people around them that have that. Um, the yeah. One thing to have faith in is the decentralization of power and the distributed computing systems that are gonna enable us to um, democratize data and democratize resource flows in better ways. And, and um, I, think, I think that, that, can, that, that, might, that may be able to help quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, Heather, okay, this yeah. is this is this is an important field for us to for us to talk about. I've now I, I think I've I, I think I've identified it, and you uh, you correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like a big part of being a creative person is to go to the edge of your own capacity and also aim to get to the edge of kind of what the collective knows and try and make things around that edge of knowledge. Tell, tell us about yeah the neural basis of creativity and um, yeah that's something that I've been really interested in. So I think I mean creativity it's very hard to quantify. You know all the way back I, when I was an undergraduate my senior thesis I wanted to I wanted to do a study on creativity. I wanted to look at the effect of um, music on creativity and and different types of music and how that affects. But what I got stuck because there was no way to quantify creativity at that time. And there are some tests about divergent thinking. So like, you know, how many different ways can you use this paper clip or not? But 
there wasn't that wasn't really satisfying like what I was thinking. I mean, that's thinking outside the box. That's divergent thinking. It's sort of part of creativity, but there was nothing. So I ended up looking at the effects of music on productivity because that was easier to measure. And I was only I wanted to graduate, so I didn't want to be there forever. <laughs> so we had to modify a bit. But but basically, um, I think creativity is. You, it's knowing all the basic facts. You take in all the knowledge. You do your homework. You know. You consciously take in all the information, and then when you can make these novel associations between ideas or put the information together in a new way that nobody thought of before, that's sort of. And sometimes we call it genius, or but it really has to do with creativity as well. And so, um, if you use people like. As examples like Darwin or something, you know, people say he's a genius, but what he did was he took information that was readily available to everybody yes. and put it together in a way that, you know, was creative and nobody else had thought of that. Or there were some people sort of tangentially thinking about Lamarck and stuff. But mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that's how I see creativity. And what, what what it is is that the unconscious has an unlimited capacity. Consciousness is limited, so it can only do hold a number of variables in mind and do calculations on them. But if you if you take in all the information consciously, you relegate it to the unconscious, it can do much more. And that's why people say they have like a flash of insight or suddenly comes up from the unconscious. Um, you have to like kind of let your unconscious work on it. And, then, and I think also when people are in these, being creative in the moment, like spontaneous creativity or improvisation, there we find that there's a certain um, brain state or a neural signature that they get into in this kind of flow state yeah. and where you get decreased dorsolateral prefrontal cortex activation yeah. um, which is kind of like the filter system in the brain it filters your behavior to conform to social norms it, it's about your ego as well so people your ego is turned down people say it, it's like flowing through them or coming from somewhere else because you don't have that sense of self yeah. um, and then you have increased medial prefrontal cortex activation which is like the internal generation of ideas so it's coming from within the filter system is turned down so it allows for novel, novel associations between ideas love it and you know and then people are it's associated with very positive emotions people want to get to that state because also parts of your prefrontal cortex that ruminate and like are anxious and think about the future consequences of things it's kind of like turned down for a bit when you're in these states you're in the moment and that is really like I think it can be very therapeutic for people because you're shutting down that inner critic, the inner voice that's always like, what are people thinking? What about this? What if something happens? Or, And just you're in the moment creating or maybe just yeah. doing some activity like that you're really f focused in like rock climbing or, you know, it could be a physical activity as well. Um, but that's the that's like the sweet spot, right, that you want to get to. And we're, we're, we're starting to understand the neural underpinnings of that state. Yeah, yeah. The flow seems to be one of the most um, uh, meaningful experiences that we can have in life. And yeah, it's super creative and it, and it drives us towards, hopefully towards our goals that you know, we're in flow going towards, towards things that we find most fulfilling in our lives. I would say, I would say um, it's a state where we feel most, I think, it, it's meaningful but also where you're at most sort of almost at peace or at ease or you're in your your most productive or some but you're mm -hmm. um <clears throat> feeling you're doing what you're supposed to be doing in that moment in a way but i think another source of yeah. meaning is um connection with people and so like a float state or being in these spontaneous creative states can be all about you um but there are also other meaningful things when you're connecting with other people or even if you're performing with an audience and there's a feedback loop between you, but I think that also is, is very meaningful and powerful. Yep. Yeah. I'm happy that you also picked on the multidisciplinary understanding of, of, of reality. When you do go deeper into different fields and make connections across those fields, it can give you really cool insights into how things work. Mm -hmm. um, I w there's been a lot of talk about neuroplasticity. Um, we want to get as far away from neurodegeneration as possible. We want to retain our cognitive capacities as long as possible at the peak cognitive capacity. Mm -hmm. So tell us about what your thoughts are around that space. Um, a patient I was just talking about earlier, I was running late because I was going over a patient was 
neurodegenerative disease. And I was going through all the different, there's many, many different types of neurodegenerative diseases and it's very hard to quantify, you know, who, who has what. But it's, you know, the patient's like, well, what can I do? And you're just like, well, there's nothing we can do. It's just, this is what's happening. And, it, and it's, you feel really frustrated as a, you know, as a, as a neuroscientist or if you're treating someone as a doctor, you're like, there's nowhere to go from here. And so that, 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 but, but, but the brain is malleable, you know, over the lifetime. So if you're getting away from the idea of, let's say you don't have neurodegenerative diseases, but just the normal aging brain, we can have, we can have what we call cognitive reserve, which is like a protective factor against those things. So if in your life you, um, are active mentally, you keep your brain active, you you know, you read, you are constantly using it like a muscle, you're gonna develop more connections and pathways that might be redundant in that you might be able to lose one but still have kind of a backup. And that's what we mean when we say cognitive reserve. So you can change your brain and as you are living and develop it so that it will be protective, more protective. If these certain neurodegenerative diseases kick in or just the normal effects of aging. But we haven't figured out how to kick the actual diseases yet. Yeah. It's almost as though the more that we stay in states of, of flow and the more that we stay in curious states and creative states that the potentially, the hopefully, the longer we can offset neurodegeneration, the more active we stay. Or the effects of the neurodegeneration. The effects of it, yeah. Will take longer to kick in. Yeah. Heather, have you th um, been looking into the, um, the, n um, the neural importance of meditation? Um, so it's not research I've done on my own, um, but I, I have looked at some of the work. And um, what's interesting is that some of the similar patterns you see in creative flow states, you also see during types of certain types of meditation, um, also in in, in certain types of hypnosis, in daydreaming, in REM sleep. There's similar kinds of patterns of activation when you're in these states, um, but they're usually associated with novel associations between, you know, free-floating thoughts. There doesn't have to be any structure or order to them. Um, and that whenever that happens, you're kind of turning down executive control, prefrontal cortex function. And they're usually associated with very positive feelings, yeah. The, it seems that meditation may be one of those keys towards unity on mm -hmm. earth. I, mm -hmm. I, I do really think so. Well, I think anytime you are in a state where you can get your ego to dissolve temporarily. I, mean, I have patients who don't have a sense of self at all, and that's not good either. So our egos are important in some ways, and that's why we've evolved to have them. Um, there are people who have no sense of self and it's they dissociate and they're not really connected to themselves and that so I think the idea of meditation and getting to these states where you lose your, your the ego dissolved is good as long as you can control it if you can't get back in that could also be anything sort of taken to the extreme is can be problematic but the more we can do that and and that's when people get this feeling of oneness with the universe and with everything I think it does it can change how we interact with each other um, so it's good to be in those states and have those insights and feel what it feels like to be sort of egoless so that when you go back to your everyday life, you can maybe have more compassion for other people. Yep. There is no hate there. There's only love there. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. nice. That's, it's so damn important. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Heather, Sorry. you've been, you've now been doing science communication across hosting shows, across doing your, your, all your work is translational, also directly impacting patients. Um, you know, this is, you go and speak in so many different places. Now, science communication is so crucial. It's like the ones that are at the edge of knowledge in their different scientific fields need, sometimes need help getting the word out in more fun, relatable, entertaining, creative mm -hmm. ways that can inspire new people to, to work themselves up in that, in that scientific uh, awareness. So tell us about that. Well, my impetus towards scientific communication. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, it really, for me, it's in, it, it kind of evolved and this was a natural process. So I, 
I was doing just being an academic and, and going to conferences and giving talks, like academic conferences. And I really say really like enjoyed giving talks and I was getting very positive feedback from it, um, which was nice. And I also had always, as actually all the way from the time I was in elementary school, all the way up through college, I did theater. I was a theater and fine arts minor in college. So I, I acted in plays always. That helps, um, yeah. yeah, so I really, I really like enjoy being in front of audiences and like connecting and that energy because not everybody likes to public, you know, do public speaking. But I, I really enjoy it, and I like, I can feel kind of an energy of an audience, and you know, I can see like if something's not working, how to like bring them back in, and um, so. But I was just doing my thing, and then I, I did some. It was actually like a debate. I was doing at um, the uh, Intelligence Square. No, no, this was long before that. This was like I was doing a debate at the uh, New York Psychoanalytic Institute. Okay, it was like a serious, like it was like serious debate with all these academics. But it was filmed and it was put online, and then like somebody from Discovery Channel saw it and called me and they're like, "Do you want to come?" I get this call like in my office. Uh, we would fly you to London like next week and audition for this show, and I'm just like, what? You know, it's like, it's awesome. <laughs> like uh, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. You just yeah. get a call one day. You're like, okay. And what it turned out was, um, this is just sort of like my origin story or whatever. But I love, like sort of what started getting me mm -hmm. into this path because like I wasn't sort of seeking it out, and it just, but I was doing like public talks for the public a bit. Anyway, so I, they fly me out there, and it turned out they had been auditioning for like months for these hosts, and they were, and everything were like whittling it down, and they were down to their like last like ten, and I just got like flown in in the last minute, like oh, and so I didn't have a lot of pressure on me because like these people were like really like, and I was like oh whatever, free trip to London, I'll go. So I was really relaxed and had fun, and the audition, all these like discovery execs were there, and there, and it was like really serious, and I was just like whatever, and um. And then I, they, they like offered to me, like, okay, so you're going to be on the road in like a few weeks and you're going to fly around the world and do this and that. And it was just like trial by fire. I had to learn. I mean, for, like within a few weeks, I literally was flying around the world, meeting people with extraordinary abilities, cool. trying to explain how they could do what they can do via science and experiments and film crew following me around. And like, it was just like, you know, I learned as I went and it was a great experience, um, which I just, I, I loved and I enjoyed. And then I said, you know, like, Actually, I think I can do, like, I, I, there, it's, it, it, it is actually a skill that you have to develop. I mean, people think it just comes naturally. You really have to learn, yeah. especially if you're a, a, a hardcore, like a scientist. How do I talk about these things that are complex in a way that people who are not experts in the field are going to, like, connect with it and engage with it? And um, so it's a learning curve. But, you know, then it's kind of a snowball effect. And once you start doing it, then people ask you to do this or that. And... And over time, you, you, yeah, you know, I don't know, I don't know how it all happened, but I really enjoy it. I love getting people excited about science, um, and but I always will have to have my like I can never just do that. Like I always yeah. need one foot in like doing the the work, the science, yeah. um, and then I, but but if I did all just that and no, it would be like a bit too serious for me. I need also the like communication part to like have fun and get people excited, or whatever. But if I did all that, I would feel like it would maybe be a little too superficial for me. Like I need both. I need the it's like yin and yang um, for me personally. But I love it. I want to get young girls. I want to get in, involved. And in, when I was growing up, there was no for me female role model scientists. You know, I remember seeing the film Contact with Jodie Foster, and I was like, oh, I was like, oh my yeah, God, like yeah. we can be, you know, and, and that was really cool for me. But there wasn't a lot of role models. So I think things are getting better. And I think um, there's obviously now a huge movement in that direction. And, you know, I just, I do what I do. I try to mentor y young girls, like, who are coming up and um, get them excited about science. And it can be cool, and you don't have to, yeah. you know, you can have fun. and. It's yeah. not like you're all nerdy or whatever the stereotype mm -hmm. was or is. So I'm really passionate about it, and I really get excited um, to get other people excited about about science and the brain. Yeah, it's as though we have both adults that are scientists that don't know that even speaking about what they're doing to the public even exists as an option. So having them be introduced to it as an option and then testing themselves out in it, that's that's great. And then with 
like you were pointing out with young girls as well, it's like we, they, again, just is it an option? You have to see it to be it, right? You have to have yeah. that mentorship mm -hmm. to, to get it done, yeah. to become yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, and I've been fortunate to have people in the sort of field of science communication kind of be mentors for me, um, like Neil deGrasse Tyson and, and Bill Nye, you know, I was fortunate enough that they kind of were mentoring me along the way and um, you know I learned a lot from them so I think it's all about yeah you have to see that it's possible and then say like why couldn't I do that too you yeah. know yeah. yeah okay I want to power around on a couple questions okay these are questions that we typically ask on the show on the way out okay. what is a core driving <laughs> principle of your life Whoa! Oh, you mean just like basic, simple basic, questions? Basic, simple questions. I thought it's like, you know, like pizza or hamburgers. Hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, okay, wait, it's just like out on a simple note. So what yeah. is the basic... A core si driving principle of your life. A core driving principle of my life. Oh my God. Um, we're just keeping it light here. Okay. Wow. You didn't give me any time to think about this either. Um, Improv. I know, improv. Um, well, oh God, core basic driving principle. For me, there's a couple of things, I guess. I mean, this is really off the top of my head, but what drives me is um, the pursuit of knowledge. I want to understand why we're here, how things work. I just, I want to understand. You know, that just is a driving factor to me. However you want to, however that manifests, it's just this drive to, to know, to understand how things work, why we're here, where do we go? You know, how does the brain work? Um, and another thing that drives me is to be present, like be to, because this life, I'm so always aware and maybe hyper aware of how short it is and how lucky we are to be here and what does this all mean. But like, don't forget to just be and enjoy it and appreciate it and the people around you. Um, to, their time with them is so precious. Yeah. Whatever it may be, like with your children or your parents or your grandparents or your friends, those time, those moments are so precious. So I want to be yeah. there, and I would sacrifice. Like, you know, for me, it's not about success in a career that drives me. Like, I don't care about that much. I care about the pursuit of knowledge, and that's kind of what drives me. But it's not about awards or accolades. It's really I would give up things like that to spend time with people I care about because that's to me so important in life. Um, so I guess that's sort of like a, a, a driving force, a motivator in terms of just how I organize and structure my life. Um, you know, I'll give up some things that might seem prestigious because like spending time with my kids is invaluable. Um, yeah, I think I think those are pretty are pretty good and you know so it's typical like Silicon Valley, like leave the world a better place. The la like I do try to like help. I think I want to have an yeah. impact by helping people. Yeah. And it's not even about making a big scientific discovery, but it's really for me where I get the most gratification personally is helping individual people yeah, yeah. like live a better life. Yes. And that's where I feel like I can have an impact because whatever, you know, if I'm gone, like, you know, people probably won't remember me, but that doesn't matter. It's about the impact that I make on individuals while I'm here. That yeah. makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's a couple of driving forces. Are, Sorry, that was not great. a quick, okay. No, those are great. <laughs> I, that, I, those were really important, okay. Heather. Thank you. Okay. If you could rebuild civilization oh from scratch. Wow. So now I'm God. Okay. How would you design it? Oh my God, what are these questions? <laughs> if I could rebuild civilization from scratch, how would I design it? Wow, okay. From scratch? I don't know, I can't go that far back. But let's just say, um, I'd like it to end up being, <laughs> I don't know how we're gonna get there, but where um, I, I kind of like the idea of like, there's no money. You know, like we're all equal. It's, I guess it's kind of like socialist, but like everybody has their basic needs met. You know, it's maybe it's like a barter system or something, right? And this way, like civilization, like how we kind of live, you know, I think that we should, it's totally possible if we could start over again from scratch and forget where we got to now, but it's totally possible with the resources we have on this earth to everybody live at a comfortable totally. level and you know 
it's that 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 is possible. Oh yeah. And you know, I don't know how we get we could get there from where we are now, but if we could start from scratch, yeah. I would love that. Money is not a thing. It doesn't matter. Everybody gets equal, all like good quality of life. That would be ideal for me, you know. For I think that people don't have to worry, struggle, think about how they're going to pay the bills. Everybody gets health care, you know. There's not the super rich, and there's not the super poor. It's just homogenous, and then we can actually like maybe spend time enjoying our lives, where we people have the time to actually enjoy the time that they're given here, and not have to spend it all yeah. just trying to survive yeah. and get their basic needs met. Yeah, yeah. So a, a re a redesign. Um, where the the baseline of, of um, basic necessities that are needed to survive are of, are quite high that are filled and then from there wherever people want to creatively endeavor they may yeah so pursue in that way we're not like you said just trying to survive but rather enjoying the time here yeah yeah freeing up people's time so they can be creative they can write a book they can paint they can do the thing that they want to yes. do in this life yeah. yes yes um, okay um, we, this wouldn't be simulation if we didn't ask you, is this a simulation? Oh, is this a simulation? Um, I'm going to say the probability, it's possible. The probability is low from what I understand of our basic physics. However, our experience of all of this is a simulation of the, in the brain. So, you know, I'm not going to say like, the physical things here are a simulation, but I think our perception of reality is a simulation. We're all running simulations sort of, mm -hmm. or I don't know if that's what you mean by simulation, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. definitely. And we're creating this reality totally. in our mind, which doesn't necessarily correlate to the real reality. But I do think there is like a real physical world out there. Yeah. We're just limited in our capacity to experience it because we're just experiencing it via these like little three pound pieces of matter. <laughs> I mean, they're pretty complex and interesting, yeah. but we're limited and we might be limited in ever knowing you know what it all means or because we're sitting here with these tiny little caveman brains trying to figure it out but um so yeah we're kind of running a simulation in our own head yeah, yeah. but i do think that this is really out there okay okay <laughs> <laughs> the 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 code is uh being tapped into so that we can better understand if it is actually right. simulation or not right. code is math in so many ways oh yeah no math is the language of the universe yeah i love math is like i love math it's yeah. everything well there you go language of a universe simulation pretty much there yeah it's, pretty yeah. <laughs> it's a simulation <laughs> um, heather what's the most beautiful thing in the world for me my children. Why? I'm like gonna cry now. I can't believe <laughs> that's, that's all it takes for me. Um, I can't explain. They're just, when I look in their eyes and it's just their life. It's life. It's everything. Mm. That's it. Mm. They're the most beautiful thing in the world to me. That's, that's the only thing. Like, if, God forbid, like if my time comes and I'm like, all I want to do is like, if I get one last thing to look at would be to look in their eyes. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's it. I mean, like, you know, the typical response would be like a sunset or something, but no, it's just like. We've had a lot of replies, to the, really good replies to that question. And that was a good one. Thanks. We also, you, you have this, you have photos of you, you know, you sp oh. speak this like a true mother that's cradling their, their child right past post birth. Um, that. Yeah. I've, I've, I've aimed to get behind my own mother's eyes as she's teaching me about the story of holding me and and that is so profound yeah yeah it's just it's just everything it's who we are it's humans it's like to me there's just nothing more like beautiful than that um, yeah. yeah that I can think of yeah <laughs> and that's and that's that's the last question and I would I would normally be ending the show right now, but because we have so much creativity, improv, freestyle flow, I want to see. Do you want to? Do you want to do a, a freestyle improv? Me? Me and I, you both. We're of us. gonna freestyle improv. Yeah. Let's okay. Do like it, yeah. what? What? Like um, we're should, gonna. Let's do a, a beat with some sort of a flow, oh maybe. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, we can switch. We can switch back and <laughs> I forth. I can't for beatbox. I can't be. Okay. Where do we? Well, how do? about I start with the beatbox and then and then you can just do something. Around. I'm gonna do like a freestyle rap. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm and we'll fine. make it around like you know science. That's what I always try and do. I try and make it around something thought provoking. You are aware that it's my husband who's the rapper. I know, I know, Papa. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hey, you guys me. did you guys did that 
uh, off, off Broadway. The top. Off the we top. We did the show yeah. off the top, but he freestyled, yeah. not me. So I'm just like, this is. I am not a. Look, I'm looking at the camera for this one. I am not a freestyle rapper. I'm not a rapper. We'll get Bob on. I do nothing of rap. It's all my husband. But I'll, you know, I'll play along. Let's do it. Okay, so I'll give you a beat oh to start. And are then, you a freestyle? Do you do freestyle? No, no I, I, I dabble for fun because I try and again, this is the whole oh, thing. Is okay. the more that you process this, the more uh, practice this, the more it kind of yes. feels good and and whatnot. Okay, yeah. we're gonna do it. All right, okay. let's do it. Okay, here we go. You're gonna beat. You're gonna do the beat. Okay. Okay. Here we are at Cornell. It's tomorrow's gonna snow, and I'm trying really hard just to get into the flow. We're talking about science, and I don't know what else to say. I'm gonna switch it over to him, okay? Awesome. Here we go. Heather's so right. She has been in some good flow talking about neuroscience. Let's go. It's been great talking about SciComm. Heather is so brilliant. It's been such an honor talking to her. Talking to you, Amy, to inspire you. Here we go. We're going to build the future. You and me and her and us all together. Let's go. Yeah. yeah, so stuff like that. Yeah, yeah I like fun. that. It's I like that. Fun. I like that. Should I do a closing? I can do a closing. Okay, let's out do it. Okay. One. Okay, okay, ready? Okay. Okay. We're almost at the end. I'm going to say goodbye. There's nothing more beautiful than my daughter, Hannah Sky. I don't know how to rap, but that's okay. I'm living in the moment. Don't know what else to say. That's it. It's not a simulation yet. But who knows what happens when the we evolve the internet? Ooh, <laughs> I love it. Thank you for joining us for that little bit. Yes, of that. thank and you so the much. The whole show. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, thank it's you. It's been great. It's thank been you. Great. And there's so much to learn about what's actually going on in our minds and in our worlds. And Heather is has been such a pleasure to have on the show. Thank you again. We greatly appreciate it. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Huge thank you. We'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Let us know your thoughts. Let's get some chat going on about some of the topics we discuss on the show. Also go and check out the links below to Heather's work. And we would love for you to build the future. Go and manifest your dreams into the world, everyone. And join us so we can continue supporting this project, doing cool things like coming out uh, to great places to interview amazing leaders. So thanks everyone, build the future, much love, and we'll see you soon. Peace.